Welcome to The Power of One. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Robin Johnson, and she is a spiritual life coach and author. So today, we're going to learn a lot, as we probably all need to. We need to learn how to look on the positive side of things when life is life and it hurts. So we maybe we can learn a little lesson. I know I can. Welcome to the show, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here, Melanie. Let me start out with this question. Why would someone speak to a life coach as opposed to a licensed therapist? You know, that's a really good question. And it's an important distinction. Therapists deal with historic traumas and they have techniques to do that. Life coaches are all about fulfilling your potential and moving you forward. So there's not an assumption that there is something within you that needs fixing from a therapeutic side. Okay. Okay. Now, now with the life coach, so just like a therapist and probably a life coach, is there a set amount of sessions that you have? Because, you know, everyone is unique and everyone is different. So with the life coach, what is the main goal? And again, does everyone have that set amount of sessions? Do you say to yourself, okay, after you do your first assessment, okay, I'm gonna have to walk with this person for six months. Okay. I'm gonna have to walk with this person for four months, or I'm gonna have to walk with this person maybe just for a month. Is it like that with the life coach sessions? It absolutely is. So it depends on what the topic is. Um, All of us are moving through life and things are happening to us. And sometimes the things that are happening are putting us back on our heels. Oh my God, I can't believe this. How is this happening to me? How is this happening to me again? And as a life coach, we understand that there are patterns that develop in all of us. But what most of us don't understand is the development of those patterns happen really early. I took a class a couple of years ago and one of the scientists, Dr. Bruce Lipton said that the default for how you operate in terms of your personality and your beliefs and behaviors is set by age seven. So whatever you've experienced, however you see life, from that point, that becomes your set point in terms of how you move through life. Okay. Okay. Whether it's traumatic, whether it's good or what have you, age seven. That's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about how beliefs are formed. Now, do you believe that those beliefs are formed at age seven? Or does that happen as we go through life and into adulthood? Okay, so here's the deal. Um, In that same session, I also learned that your brain doesn't come online in terms of its ability to analyze and discern until age eight, which means that everything that's happening to you, you are making up a meaning for what's going on because you're not able to process through all of the different distinctions that you would have as you're, as you're getting older. So let me give you off the wall, for instance, Okay. from my own life. Um, There's a study that's out. um, It's called ACEs, Adverse Mm -hmm. Childhood Experiences, ACEs, done by Kaiser Permanente. um, uh, What, almost 30 years now. Bottom line is that if you are, sexually assaulted, if you're emotionally abused, if you are abandoned by a parent, if you're neglected by a parent, if one of your parents uh, has been incarcerated, uh, if there's not enough food to eat, if there's not enough clothing, if you don't feel safe, all of those things make up the ACEs. 
-hmm. When I took the test, I had six out of 10 aces. They say 85% of the people have at least one and 60% mm. of the people have three. I had six. Mm. So what, what happened to me is product of divorce. Father leaves when I'm age three. That And he was the one who always gave me hugs and kisses and very affectionate. That left me open to sexual abuse, to being manipulated, to being punished, to be... And so now I'm creating a whole scenario in my head that I'm not worthy. I don't matter. Doesn't matter what I want. I'm not safe. All of these things were coming out of my experiences going up into age seven. What happens after that is you find your ways to cope. Uh, so for uh -huh. me, sexual assault, I just stopped talking to the guy who was, quote unquote, looking after me. Mm. I just, I just shut down. If he, if he showed up, I, I just wouldn't speak to him. Mm. That was my way of coping. It didn't solve the problem of the powerlessness that I felt. So then what, what happens? I go on, these things get buried. Now they're the default. You don't think about it anymore. I go on in life and living. And in every relationship I had with a man, if he decided something, if I said no, I instantly got fearful if he got real strong in his opinion about something. Not knowing why I'm reacting, but it's part of the default. If somebody would argue with me, like my mother would argue often with me, she had a really bad temper. I would instantly shut down. I, I learned not to argue with authority. So now I'm out in the world and I'm working, but all authority, somebody, my boss, their boss, anybody, all they would have to do is be angry and, and, and show some real strong energy. And I would back down, even if they were wrong. Mm. These are ways that we come across these beliefs that we don't know are in there. And we function from that place. And that's why you can have beliefs that start when you're in, uh, um, when you're young, these, these inner child beliefs, but then they manifest through time, way into adulthood. And you don't even know they're there. You just know that's how I operate. And, but this isn't working for me. Break down beliefs for me and for the, the, the viewers. So when we speak about how beliefs are formed, you know, it, it just boggles my mind that we have today a lot of youth that have no regard for human life? And how can someone 14 or 15 kill somebody? So when we say how beliefs are formed, are we speaking about how we're bred in our house? You know what I mean? Coming up, like you said, daddy gave you the hugs and the kisses. If there's nobody there to give you the hugs and the kisses, are you now becoming desensitized to, to feeling. So break down beliefs for me and for the viewers. Oh, wow. Okay. So let me think about the best way to do this. Let's look at what can desensitize a person. Because in order to take another life, you have to see that person as separate from you. Uh -huh. You have to you you have to say you know whatever happens to them has no impact on me. Uh -huh. When you're growing up, if you're growing up in a household where you're the one who's punished for whatever the reason, rather justified or not, rather you try to explain yourself or not, rather you don't feel heard or seen or visible or safe, in order for you to cope in that environment you withdraw your emotional body. You withdraw your feelings. I can remember being beat as a kid and I remember thinking, I'm sick of getting beat. And my mother's like, well, I don't care, you did wrong. I didn't even do that, my sisters did that. Well, I don't care, I'm gonna beat you anyway. What happened to me, I was so angry about getting beat that when my mother came with the belt and started beating me, I would not cry. Mm. It's almost as if wherever I was, I wasn't in my body. Mm. You can suffer so much harm 
as a kid and you're powerless to do something about it. And that builds rage and anger within you. That becomes a belief around how you see the world. People mm. that have power abuse it. And therefore, if anybody comes at me who has power, then I'm going to unload on them because I will not be victimized again by somebody in power. That becomes a belief. But the anger, the behavior that drives that is because that environment, those experiences were never processed out. And the emotion from that experience is still stuck within you, driving your behavior. Mm. So now with the things that you've experienced, so the beliefs that you had spilled over into your adulthood. So you wasn't always this fine tuned, <laughs> strong act. So when you came into your adulthood, it was a little messy. Wow, that's a nice way of putting it. So let me let me give you the basic beliefs I came in with. Abandonment okay. from the father. Um a, a, a fear of a, a fear of not being safe. Um, arguing from parents, from mothers and other older relatives and people being really nice, but just to manipulate me. Okay. So those are my fundamental beliefs coming into adulthood. So what do you think happened to me? Every time I had a relationship with a guy, if he got aggressive and belligerent, then I'm gone because I'm not feeling safe. Anytime mm. I was at work and somebody's mad and angry and arguing with me, I'm not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Anytime, anytime somebody's being really, really nice to me to get me to give them what I have to help them with what they need. You know, you always got these girlfriends. Oh, can you just help me out? If you can only loan me $5 or 500 or a thousand, I'll give it back. And then they don't. And mm -hmm. now I'm all jammed up because I was giving what I didn't need at the moment, but need now. Mm hmm. And so my life was this continuous up and down pattern. My life would operate very smoothly when nobody was in it. Mm. But as soon as somebody got in my life needing something from me, then my attention went to them. Why? Part of the fundamental belief is you can't be selfish. You can't not help. You can't not do these things. That's what I was bred with. That was part of the culture. You give up what you have. You share everything. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether you don't have enough. You give what you have. Right. Now, when you're out in the world and there's nobody backing you up and you give what you have. Well, when the rent is due, they don't want to hear you gave your girlfriend right. some money. You know what right. I'm saying? I right. mean. Well, when the telephone bill is due, they don't want to hear, you know, you you got your boyfriend out of jail. You know, right. they're not trying to hear that. Right. right. But this, this, this inability to stop self-sabotaging is what comes from fundamental beliefs that are not healed. So mm -hmm. even though I'm having these bad experiences, I'm still doing this. I would just drop that person. But right. the fundamental experience, the fundamental beliefs act as magnets. And they're bringing the next set of people who act like the last set of people. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately what led me into life coaching. I'm like, there's something else going on here. I can manifest, I can create, I can have a great life until somebody gets in and gets too close to me and then I lose everything. I'm helping, I'm too busy trying to help and support. Something is wrong here. And mm -hmm. that's what got me into life coaching about 20 years ago. And my first life coaching mentor at the time, her name was Debbie Ford. And she had a fundamental belief that we all have a shadow side. We've got these beliefs we don't know about that we hide. And the way you see them is because they're the exact opposite of how you're trying to be. If you're mad at somebody for being selfish, it's because that's who you really are. That's your, that's mm. your shadow. If you're angry at somebody for being aggressive, then your shadow is there's something in you around this whole area of aggression. And so I started taking my life apart 
about that time and looking at the beliefs that were coming out of my childhood. What like what happened to me and where was I still stuck? Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a process. I mean, to me, I mean, we have a lot of people out here with the quick fixes, but it's a process to understand that you're now at a place in life that's not working. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets there. And when that place comes, all you want to know is how can I change this? Mm -hmm. How can I move myself into a different way of being? Because this isn't working. Why isn't it working anymore? I've always been like this. Why isn't it working? It's not working because we've outgrown all of those fundamental beliefs that have now held us in check. It's almost like we're now bouncing up against a glass ceiling and mm -hmm. we have got to break through. You know, it's it's something you say that because again, coming up and your parent beliefs can spill over into their children correct me if I'm wrong. And, and you come up and, and as kids, you're like, okay, I got to do this. I got to do that. Oh, I can't do this. Cause you know, my parents want to prove this. And everybody knows that I had the perfect mother and father, <laughs> you know, coming up, but here I am in my fifties living out my, like, like, and, and, you know, I'll tell my, someone a little bit of the story, but like one, one of my best friends, I have two best friends mm. and we were best friends since nursery school. Ooh. And then the one Janelle. So we started learning about weaves. And it must have been in the 90s. And I mean, when I tell you she had the weave rock. And, <laughs> I, and, and I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that. Now, my parents never told me don't wear a weave. But there was something there that was like, Melanie, you can't do that. Like, am I fear? Do I have a fear of judgment? You know what I mean? The first time I got braids in my hair... I was, I was probably close to 50 <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, you know what I mean? You can't do this. It's unprofessional. Uh, what are they going to say in the corporate world? Oh no, you can't. I, I literally paid my girl to braid my hair and I took it out in less than a week. Cause I was just like, so like, oh my goodness, like what's, what's going to happen? So we have these beliefs that are embedded in us from our parents that aren't necessarily wrong, but they're not ours. They're, they're not, you're not right. ours. You're Therein right. is the problem. Most of us are running. We call that conditioning. The conditioning comes not only from your parents, from your culture, from your education, from your exposure, from your work environments, all of that, from what country you live in, from what race you are, what gender, all of that creates this composite of who is you. Mm. And the problem that many of us have is all of that composite. I don't like none of that stuff. That's not even who I am. I don't agree with any of that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, right now, one of the biggest arguments I have with my mother is she always, she was a, a diehard civil rights advocate and I'm all about harmony and balance and can we get along? So every conversation with her is, you know, it's about, the system and the structure and what whites are doing and blacks are doing. And I'm like, no, you know, it's all about individual liberty and we don't all have to take responsibility and, you know, we just need to get along. No, you're wrong. No, you know, it's, it's cultural. You know, uh -huh. we uh -huh. all have a fundamental way of seeing reality. The problem that we're having is we don't give each other room to become who we are. Mm. I, I agree. I do. I agree with that 100%. You know, my victim services experience has been in Philly and I'm, I'm grateful and I'm blessed for my victim services experience, but I had to step away from Philly for a minute because again, I was, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And it was just like, I got to step away for a minute and I had to regroup. And, and, and then I went to an agency called Nova in Bucks County and I was in my little office. I would go at windows, you know what I mean? I had a, a, a beautiful office, windows, and I would just sit there. And most of the day I was by myself. I was to myself, don't get me wrong, you know, I work. But I needed that to regroup. And just for me, to have permission 
to be me, you know what I mean, in silence. I don't need to, to always be speaking to somebody or asking for somebody's permission or asking, is, is this okay? And, and, it, and I did that for almost a year and it allowed me to regroup. And I'm back in Philly, working back in Philly, which my first love with Northwest Victim Services. But now I have a whole new perspective on life. And I will say this with my dad getting sick. It, 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 it crumbled my world. But then it also made me realize half of this stuff that people are all tripping about or getting angry about, it means absolutely nothing. So I think when things happen in your world, mm -hmm. sometimes that helps you align yourself to your true self. And therein is the problem we're not aligned with our true self. Mm. We have some image that we're living up to. Mm -hmm. Even for the little little young thugs who are like the gangsters, that's an yeah. image. You're right. You any of them aside, have a real conversation. They are some of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet, but yeah. probably some of the more sensitive ones. Mm. And they've had to hide that to be mm -hmm. protected. And so part mm -hmm. of them running with these, you know, these structures is a brotherhood that protects them. Mm. You know, we and, and part of the brotherhood, you got to do certain things to be staying in the brotherhood to prove that you're loyal. And, you know, right. and, and now, and, you know, I lived in D.C. at one point um, and walking down the street, um, this guy comes by, shoots this guy driving down the street. They catch him and they, they wanted to know why he shot him. He said it was a gang initiation. Mm. He was 15. You know, I just believe that we, all of us, even the young people are here for a purpose. Mm. And it has nothing to do with how we're being raised or acculturated at that time. If we were all free to be and really given all the basic education, basic love, basic concern, and free to just bring our talents forward, what kind of world would we have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And instead, that's not what we get. We're we're like we're like flowers trying to grow through cracks in the cement on the side. Right. right. Too many yeah. obstacles all around us that don't give us the opportunity to truly grow. That's true. And, and yeah, therefore, if you're if you're if you're growing as a flower through the crack in the sidewalk, you're already mm -hmm. going to be somewhat limited in right. how you expand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's sad too. And like you're, you're speak, you spoke about the 15 year old. I, I think it's so sad when children are robbed of their innocence. You are forced again to be something or somebody that you truly are not. Are not. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Great conversation. Listen. I'm going to rock my braids. I'm going to do me. And I don't care whether I'm, I think I'll, I think I'll be 52. I don't know how old I'll be. I don't know, but whatever. I'm going to do me. Whatever I want to do, I'm, I'm going to do it. Don't worry. I'll do it with decency and order. I will be well-dressed, but I am going to play around with some hairstyles in my, in my old age. Thank you so much for joining me today, Robin. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. It, it was a great conversation. It was a fun conversation. And, and what I want you to walk away with is it is okay for you to be you, but understand, respect others and do not hurt anyone in your journey and finding that king that you are or that queen that you are. Remember the power of one starts with you. Peace and love.